Hello, this is the American Medical Association's Moving Medicine video and podcast. Today, we're talking with Dr. Paul Offit, the director of the Vaccine Education Center and an attending physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia about his new book, You Bet Your Life. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Dr. Offit, it is great uh, to talk to you. I'm so excited to talk to you about your book um, because it really is... Uh, a fascinating look at the, uh, uh, the failures and tragedies uh, concurrent with medical innovation. And uh, I just, I, I want to start with a, a question to you in general, which is, you know, a lot of the conversations that I have over the past two years with physicians um, have been about reassurance, uh, especially in regard to uh, vaccines. Uh, I'm just going to say your book is not necessarily in the same vein as reassurance. Um, and I'm curious, why did you feel like now was the right time to undertake that particular message? I think it's about uh, asking people to have realistic expectations when there's a medical innovation. I mean, I'm, I'm on the FDA's vaccine advisory committee. I have been for four years. And when, for example, in December of 2020, we sat down to make a decision about Pfizer's vaccine or Moderna's vaccine, we were being asked to make a decision about, give, about vaccines for hundreds of millions of people based on studies in 20 or 50,000, 15,000 people, right? Pfizer, 20,000 people got a vaccine, Moderna, 15,000 people got a vaccine. Always, always, and historically, with regard to medical innovations, there is a problem. You learn as you go. There is invariably a human price paid for, for innovation, and we knew nothing about mRNA vaccines. This was a novel technology. And so the question was, when was the other shoe going to drop? How bad was that, that problem going to be? And how rare was it going to be? And it ended up being actually remarkably rare. The mRNA vaccines are a rare cause of myocarditis, inflammation of the heart muscle. The uh, vectored virus vaccines like Johnson & Johnson or AstraZeneca are a very rare cause of these blood clots. Now, now myocarditis and blood clots also ca are, are caused by the disease at a far more common rate. I just I just was, I guess, worried that when people would see that, they would go, well, shouldn't we have known this? Shouldn't we have known this beforehand? Because it's never true. You're never so sophisticated in science or medicine, at least not to this point, that you're not going to find out something that surprises you. And both of those things surprised us. Do you think that uh, you know, people's expectations around risk have gotten out of whack relative to past medical innovations? I think people don't understand risk. I, I think that um, they um, tend to overrate risks from something that you do. So, for example, if you give yourself or you give your child a vaccine and there is a risk associated with that, they rate that much higher than a risk, say, of, of not giving the vaccine and then having the disease. I mean, there are no risk-free choices. There are just choices to take different risks. So the goal is always to take a lesser risk. And I think that when people, for example, think, well, I'm just not going to get this vaccine, then that's they think that that's a risk-free choice, but it's not. And in the case of COVID, for example, um, you're far more likely to suffer myocarditis, far more likely to suffer blood clots, for example, if you, if you risk the disease, which is common, than if you choose the vaccine. And I think we don't get that. Also, I don't think we numerically ever understand risk. You know, the... Uh, New York State, for example, sells lottery tickets where you have roughly a 14 million to one chance of winning with the simple phrase, it could happen to you. And I think that's how people see it. I think too, uh, just in that calculation, uh, I think there are probably pretty good parameters about what happens if you are to get COVID uh, in terms of those outcomes, vaccinated versus unvaccinated. But maybe like people are missing that first one, which is like, what are my odds of getting COVID in the first place? Maybe you can't make that calculation. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, I think people, um, they, they uh, well, I'm sorry. I think John Udell, who was the head of uh, the virus research lab at the National Institutes of Health said it best. He said, over the next few years, you're gonna have two choices, which is to get vaccinated or get naturally infected. This is a common, highly contagious disease. And so that should be the calculation, but I don't think people see it that way. I think they live on a lot of denialism. They think this doesn't happen to me. And then when they see people dying, because it's a little hard to ignore the fact that almost a million people have died in this country from this, this disease, they say, well, that person probably just had you know, certain medical problems that put them at risk, but that's not me. One of the examples that you give, and I think it's good perspective, is about innovation around the polio vaccine, uh, where 
there was a great deal that went wrong up front, uh, but it evolved in a place where uh, things went, went right to the point, of course, where we've pretty much eradicated that. What, what do you lay out in terms of learnings from that experience and what have we been able to carry forward from there? You know, I, th I think it's interesting when, when Donald Trump, uh, President, then President Trump, stood up at the Rose Garden and announced Operation Warp Speed, um, this massive $10 billion infusion into the COVID vaccine effort, he said, we haven't seen anything like this since the Manhattan Project, meaning since that, you know, 1942 to 1946 uh, project to make uh, nuclear uh, uh, arsenals, uh, nuclear bombs. Uh, but we had, and the thing was the 1955, 1954 to 1955, that was Operation Warp Speed 1. What, what the March of Dimes did was they funded the research. They paid for the big clinical trial, the phase three trial, which normally a company would pay for. They mass produced that vaccine for, for, they paid for mass production of that vaccine for five companies to do that, even though we didn't know whether the vaccine worked or not. They built the buildings. I mean, they, that was Operation Worst B1. And when the, the trial was announced as being successful, that vaccine was licensed in two and a half hours. So within a year, you had done the major sort of clinical trial, mass produced the vaccine and gotten it out there. And as a consequence, we eliminated polio from this country by the late 1970s. That was Operation Warp Speed 1. It tells you what you can do when you put a lot of money into something. But I think what we learned from that uh, episode also was probably the hardest part of making a vaccine actually is mass producing it. Um, it's easier to make 700 doses in your laboratory than it is to make hundreds of millions of doses. And, and that's where the problem came. There was one of the companies that was a, a relatively newcomer to vaccine uh, manufacture was Cutter Laboratories of Berkeley, California, and they made that vaccine badly. They failed to completely inactivate the virus with the chemical formaldehyde. As a consequence, 120,000 children, primarily in the West and Southwest, were inoculated with live, dangerous polio virus. About 40,000 of Developed abortive or short lived paralysis. 164 children were permanently paralyzed and 10 were killed. I think it was the worst biological disaster in this country's history and led really to the birth of vaccine regulation. Um, that was a tragic moment. One other thing about that moment, because it sort of relates to. Um, to when we are considering vaccines for children, when, when we considered vaccines for the, the, the 5 to 11 year old, COVID vaccines for the 5 to 11 year old, that was roughly a 2400 child trial, roughly. And I got a lot of pretty much hateful email from parents saying, really, 2400 children? That's all you want to look at? Whereas for the, for the adults trials for Pfizer's vaccine, you looked at 40,000 people. Why, so, well, just, why such a small trial? Now, in that trial, in that 2400 trial, which was basically two to one vaccine to placebo, 1600 children got vaccine, uh, uh, about uh, 800 got placebo. So in the placebo group, there were 16 cases of, of COVID. So 16 children suffered COVID. So I wrote back to some of these people and I said, OK, we could do a 24,000 child trial, not a 2400 child trial. And then there wouldn't be 16 cases of COVID. There would be 160 cases of COVID, roughly. So what price do you want to pay for knowledge? What human price do you want to pay for knowledge? And that related back to the, the, um, the polio vaccine because Jonas Salk didn't want to do that clinical trial. He, he had tested the vaccine in about 700 children in and around the Pittsburgh area, found that it was safe, found that it induced an immune response, which he thought was going to be protective. He didn't want to do that trial. He didn't want to do, do give placebo to children, first and second graders in the 1950s, knowing that, that every year 20 to 30,000 children would be paralyzed by polio, that 1,500 children would die from polio. But nonetheless, the trial was done. 420,000 children got vaccine, 200,000 got, children got placebo, and they were followed over a year. It was the biggest really medical experiment, I think, in history in terms of number of people tested. And the vaccine was deemed safe, potent, and effective. So how do we know it was effective? We knew it was effective because 16 children died of polio in that study, all in the placebo group. We knew it was effective because 36 children were paralyzed in that study, 34 in the placebo group. Those were first and second graders in the 1950s. I was a first and second grader in the 1950s. Those children could have lived long, fruitful lives, but for the flip of a coin. So it works both ways. I mean, there is invariably a price paid for knowledge, and we have to be willing at some level to accept that price, but it's really hard. Yeah, you point that out, that, you know, the heartbreak of those particular statistics. Um, uh, don't think about uh, many people necessarily think about that when they think about those clinical trials. Um, you also take uh, the readers through a lot of different medical innovations uh, 
um, not just vaccines, but uh, blood transfusions, uh, anesthesia, gene therapy, chemotherapy, among others. And, you know, obviously, thanks to, you know, these medical breakthroughs, the lifespan of Americans has increased by 30 years. That's a huge improvement. Yet, all of these different episodes provide lessons um, uh, about when and how we accept new technologies. Is there, is there ever a time uh, when that risk is too great? And what barometer do we use to determine that? Right. I mean, it, it's uh, it's interesting because um, the 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 heart transplant story has sort of evolved since I've written the book. But um, what I talked about in the book is that there are, um, if you look at the sort of medical history of heart transplant, it is pretty grim. I mean, we've gotten much better now at heart transplants in terms of picking the right kind of immune suppressive agents. But nonetheless, you know, about four thousand people are on the heart transplant waiting list. So about thirteen hundred of whom will die while waiting. So do you want to take the risk, as I mentioned in this book, of getting a pig heart, you know, which would be genetically modified so that you would be less likely to um, reject it. But, you know, you you would be one of the first ones to do that. Well, that just happened, actually, since I wrote the book at the University of Maryland, there was a pig heart transplant. There was recently a pig uh, kidney transplant. So we did enter that that era. But again, it's it's, it's a, actually Christian Bernard who did the uh, the first heart transplant on a man named Louis Washkansi who was dying. Um, he said, you know, if you if you if you come to a lake and it's it's full of alligators, you're not going to swim across the lake unless you're chased by a lion. Then you, you you'll you'll take your chances. And that's sort of how he saw that first heart transplant. The man he believed had little to lose because he was dying. And, and but so but with regard to now, if you're on the heart transplant waiting list, you know, you may be one of those people who dies while waiting. Do you want to take a riskier procedure? Um, there are no risk free choices. I love your your analogy there, which is like you went across that bridge or not. I, if you have a lion chasing you, that does affect your risk perception uh, versus not. Um, you also said, uh, and I quote, in the domain of medical innovation, tragedy cannot be prevented no matter how many regulations are put in place. And at the same time, some failures uh, have led to greater oversight. Uh, and that's clear. How do you, how do you find that balance? Uh, and what role do you see um, with oversight uh, playing in the realm of medical innovation, because it's going fast and furious right now, because uh, so much of, you know, when you think about gene therapy and anything beyond that, it's, it's, it's just so new and there, there are a lot of unknowns. No, I think gene therapy is a perfect example of this. Uh, the the because at one I'm at the University of Pennsylvania, so that was the first gene therapy death. It was a, a boy named or named Jesse Gelsinger at the time was 19 years of age, and you know Jim Wilson, who was the researcher at the time, sort of slowly went forward to introduce the gene he was lacking, which was uh, ornithine transcarbamylase, which meant he would get a buildup of ammonia in his bloodstream, and occasionally he would uh, he would go into a coma when he refused to take the medicines he needed. So he was one. One of the first gene transplant recipients. And interestingly, that the vector that was used by Jim Wilson was a replication defective adenovirus, which is essentially the exact same thing that's used in Johnson & Johnson's vaccine or in AstraZeneca's vaccine, which are also replication defective adenoviruses. They're the gene that's introduced in the cells is the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Here for Jesse Gelsinger, it was the gene ornithine transcarbamylase. And so Wilson went slowly. And then nonetheless, Jesse Gelsinger had essentially a sepsis like this disease, which overwhelmed him and he died. And, and it was only in retrospect that you realized that he had this massive production of interleukin-6. And so when that was realized, and then, then you realize that the people who get uh, CAR T therapy, um, which is, uh, again, a way where you take someone's T cells out, you re-engineer them so that they'll kill your cancer cells. And then that happened with a girl named Emily Whitehead, a five-year-old who had a, essentially a resistant leukemia. And so they did CAR T therapy for her. Then, her. then she started to get the same symptoms as Jesse Gelsinger. They looked, they realized she had the same problem, inter, you know, an increase in interleukin-6 production. And at the time, then there was a, a medicine, tocilizumab, which could treat that. And so her life was saved. And so she became... A, a success story. And so she met President Obama. She was on, you know, the Today Show. She's constantly feted. And if you go to the CAR T therapy lab, what you see are all the pictures of her 
her standing next to Obama, her on, on Dateline NBC and NBC Today show. Um, what you don't see is pictures of Jesse Gelsinger, but it, it is people like Jesse Gelsinger who allowed people like Emily Whitehead to live. So we always are much more comfortable celebrating our successes and not the failures that invariably led to those successes. But in terms of, of, of regulation, when, the gene, when, when Jesse Gelsinger died, there were many more regulations put in place to try and prevent that from ever happening again. But nonetheless, there was a retrovirus gene that was used by French researchers. It was given to 10 children who had severe combined immunodeficiency disease. And four of those 10 children got leukemia because of that vector, because it inserted, inserted itself right in front of a gene that increased your risk of leukemia. So again, you can't regulate away from these kinds of problems. You can't, you always learn as you go. And that was the purpose of writing this book, to try and make that point. Mm -hmm. You also point out, uh, you know, when something bad does happen, we tend to want to create a narrative uh, where we blame somebody or vilify the innovator. And, uh, you know, you point out several instances of this, a person that invented the x-ray. One, one day you've got, uh, you know, statues being built in your honor, and the next you're not, or even Jonas Salk uh, for, you know, what he was able to bring, but then you have a bad outcome uh, due to bad manufacturing. Now, how do you this has got to have a chilling effect on you, of course, your desire to innovate because there is that risk. How do you inspire innovation uh, for the ne that next generation, next generation of physicians, knowing uh, that there there are consequences, like you point out? Well, we, we like to believe that there's some way to explain all this, which is to say that there's some way we can control it. So if we can find, say, look, Jim Wilson, for example, who did that gene therapy, he was the bad guy because he wasn't careful enough, because he may have missed something in the animal model experiments, et cetera, where that wasn't true. I mean, he went, he went slowly and carefully and just ended up learning something that had to eventually be learned and was. Same thing with Jonas Salk. I mean, he wasn't responsible for mass producing the vaccine, but he, he you know, he, he certainly Certainly, there were certain um, things that were regarding testing in those companies that weren't done as well as they could have been done. But Jonas Salk was easy to blame for the Cutter incident, even though it wasn't his problem. But that gives us some sense of control. See, that's why it happened. That's why it, that way it won't happen the next time. I think part of the, the point I'm trying to make in this book is it will happen the next time. You can't regulate away these issues. There's always a learning curve. And people will say, well, OK, you know, I'll just wait till the learning curve's over. But it's never over. There, uh, you can tell I'm really excited about this book. I, I just loved reading it. And there's so much to take away from it, which we obviously can't talk about here. You know, of all the stories that you told, uh, which one stands out to you the most and stays with you? Um, I think probably the, the Ryan White story, the blood transfusion story. I mean, so he, he, cause, just because he was such a brave young man. I, I mean, here's, here's a boy who had hemophilia and had a hemophilia at a time when uh, HIV first came into this country and contaminated the blood supply. And he, he, you know, he, he uh, got HIV from a contaminated uh, lot of blood and he was vilified because at the time, you know, it was believed that, that this must have meant that he was gay. And so he was ostracized and, and it, we were unsure about exactly how HIV was transmitted. And so he was he was really marginalized, but he was so brave and straightforward for such a young man. That was an inspiring story to me. And there were a lot of inspiring stories in, the, in these in this as I sort of go through these innovations. But I think that and also, you know, you're never play, past the problem with blood transfusions because there can, may be new viruses that are introduced into the population or there may be viruses that we don't test for. So anytime you get a whole blood transfusion, you are to some extent taking risk. But, you know, the, the, the point in medicine is to make sure that the benefits clearly outweigh the risks, even though some of the rest are, are unknown, which has always been true with, with blood transfusions. I mean, we used to do it back in the 1600s. They did plant transfusion using farmyard animals. Um, we don't do that anymore. But, you know, we certainly learned hepatitis B virus entered the blood supply and, and probably caused the largest single source uh, outbreak of, of an infectious disease ever uh, in terms of bloodborne diseases. So you learn as you go, always. My well, last question, and we, you, know, you hear this in regard to many things, but this idea, if we don't pay attention and learn from the powerful lessons of the past, then we are condemned to repeat them. What is the one thing that you want uh, readers of your book, and particularly those in the medical profession, to walk away with after reading this book? Right, that, 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 that fear of an adverse outcome shouldn't stifle innovation push forward, realize that there are going to be problems because there always have been, but that shouldn't slow research. We should be made wise by our experiences, not nervous by them. 
Dr. Ruffett, thank you so much. Uh, I loved your book for everybody out there. Pick up a copy of You Bet Your Life. Uh, it's just a great piece of history with so many implications for what we've been going through today. Uh, Dr. Ruffett, thanks for being here. I really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, make sure you don't miss another great conversation like this. Subscribe to our YouTube channel or check out all our videos and podcasts at ama-assn.org slash podcasts. Thanks for joining us today. Please take care. Thank you.